in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Dustin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome, all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Dustin Melbardis, and joining me today, for the first time as a group since September of 2022, 18 months ago, are my good friends and co-hosts. Lizzie Haynes, say hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Excited to be here tonight. Brian Fry, say hi. Good evening, folks. Thanks for coming. Hello, everyone. Today's movie features a rock star. What is a movie that has a music artist acting in film that you thought was inspired? Lizzie. I have to be totally honest. This is like kind of a random pick, but I have to go with Jennifer Lopez in Enough. Like, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that movie, but that is a really, really yeah. solid movie. And I am not particularly a huge JLo fan in terms of her music after like late nineties, but I am a massive fan of her movies. Like she really got it right for like a good 10 years during that, mm. like Selena and, but enough in particular, I think is a fantastic thriller. She does great. Didn't we cover out of sight, the George Clooney sort of yeah, steamy thriller. Mm -hmm. She's good in that yeah. too. She's and made her some good choices. Uh, her love doesn't cost a thing. Brian, same question. You know, I, I dug a little deep on this one. I'm going to go with Amy Mann and The Big Lebowski. I actually watched that movie before knowing who she was. So that one that one oh, messed okay. me up. Uh, she's basically this German nihilist who helps fake the kidnapping. She's one of the nihilists? Yeah, in the, yeah, yeah, in the, in the diner scene with the, the bandaged toe. <laughs> wow. In the cowboy okay, room. yeah, I can... Uh, then I guess I completely would have missed her anyway. Uh, well, my, my answer here, and I, I thought to myself, I thought, is it, is it wrong that I'm tapping into David Bowie with his portrayal of Tesla in The Prestige? <gasps> oh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I forgot. Oh, my gosh. That was he good. was, that was he's good. So with all the top good. hats. Oh, my goodness. Right. Uh-huh. He's so that is good. A good one. Great it's choice. A completely different feel than what we're covering tonight, which we're going to get into soon. It's not like you didn't read the title my, uh, before opening this podcast. My back, <laughs> my backup was Alanis Morissette and Dogma. As God, right? As God. <laughs> As God. <laughs> oh gosh! Oh my I was gosh! Waiting I... To see, I was waiting to see if somebody went with uh, Tom Petty in The Postman. I, I didn't think harder than landing on David Bowie. I, 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 I mean, that's I, a good one. I completely yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. I, I know that uh, Chester is in Crank. Uh, lead singer Linkin Park uh, is, is in oh, Crank. Oh, he would be. That's, I, I've <laughs> never seen that movie, but I, but I, know, but I know what it's but about. I, I assume he would be in that. It's like Fred, Fred, it's like Fred Durst in a Leprechaun movie. Like, yeah, I yeah, figured. <laughs> That makes sense, right? Yeah, it really yeah. tracks. <laughs> Lizzie, what's the last movie that you saw? Last movie I saw was the remake of When a Stranger Calls. I really have no other explanation other than the fact that I was bored and I just really wanted a cozy horror movie. And that's really what that movie is for me. It is nothing other than just like complete cozy horror. Is it worth it? Um, if I'm being totally honest, no, it's not. I think it's a lot of jump scares if that's your kicks. So if that's something that you're into, then maybe it's something to check out. But otherwise, the story itself kind of falls flat. The original is far better. Cool. Brian, what is the last movie you saw? Uh, so I've been on a really, really big uh, Guy Ritchie kick recently with the release of the Gentleman TV series on Netflix. And uh, so I had to go back and watch the film because it is, I, I'd say maybe my favorite, but I think it is my favorite Guy Ritchie film. And uh, it's also the film that really made me realize that my 
mouth belongs in Great Britain. Like, that's how I would talk if I was allowed to talk that way all the time. And, and it's only because I live in this society that I don't talk like that. Uh, what an interesting way of describing that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Char- Charlie Hoonan, his, his, him talking to Fletcher is how I would talk to a friend of mine if right. that was a thing. Yeah, if only you had the just geographical upbringing to make sense in that okay. way. Yeah. And, and I'll say yeah. one more thing on this. We had a receiving manager who was from Scotland, and he could cuss flawlessly in front of customers, employees. It didn't even sound like he was cussing. Like in his accent, it just sounded normal. I don't know how he managed it, but he would say all the naughty words, and people would just be like, ha, 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 ha. And I'm just like, how did he do that? <laughs> It's witchcraft. It is witchcraft. <laughs> Love uh, it. Uh, yeah, I uh, I get myself into a little trouble uh, with my uh, ribald language from time to time. Uh, but I think I have, you know, that old saying, like, you teach people how to talk to you. Uh, I think That's people kind of under, understood that about me, that I'm not being crass. I'm being serious. I also have a reputation of being a mean guy. My last movie I saw no. was Three from Hell. Either you two familiar with Three from no, Hell? No, I've never heard of that. Neither had I. I've seen Apparently. just From Hell. <laughs> yeah, not From yeah. Hell. Uh, this was Three from Hell. Uh, this is, and I did not know it was a thing, but uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, followed up by The Devil's Rejects. Mm-hmm. And then in 2019, right. they made a third called Three from Hell. Oh, is it just as like awful and gross wait hold on i thought that in the devil's rejects they all like got you know or i don't know if we're allowed to say the spoiler but like it kind of ended for them and with uh, in a big in a big bang way yeah and so th- this was just i didn't even try to put the pieces together it was just okay well it's the same it's some of the same characters you already know and it's the same style and that's what i was going to say about it i didn't hate it but i didn't love it either uh, i know that people generally don't love the Rob Zombie movie style uh, Mm -hmm. or the the final product, really. But it's the style that I like. I I like that he has a style and he does it. And he has nobody to impress because he's already Rob Zombie. So he's like, yeah, I'm going to put my wife in this movie and I'm going to do this same thing. We're going to have a psychedelic like dance sequence right in the middle of it. And I, I, I like that he takes that chance and he makes that choice didn't like the movie though didn't think i can appreciate that. that he's not my director of choice i'm not a fan of his but i do appreciate that he is consistent yeah just like you were saying like he really has a brand and he sticks to that and i can appreciate that about him yeah and i'd say the weird thing for music, me is though. I, mean, I mean i i wasn't the guy getting his albums at ear ecstasy when i was a kid but you can't like miss it like you can't miss his music so that was a popular high school music for me well tonight uh, speaking of music and speaking of rock stars and movies, Lizzie, what are we covering? We are covering Labyrinth. Labyrinth from 1986, starring David Bowie and Jennifer Connelly. A uh, budget of $25 million, only made about $12.8 million domestically, but $34 million globally, so it did make some money. Placed 66th in our box office, which came uh, directly behind April Fool's Day and directly ahead of Club Paradise. The number one movie that year, Top Gun. Hey, check out our episode 185 if you want to hear us talk about that. IMDB rating of 7.1, Rotten Tomatoes. Critics' tomato meter gives it 75%. Audience score much higher at 86%. Uh, Nominated for a couple awards. uh, Nominated for Saturn, uh, BAFTAs, uh, and a Hugo. Didn't take home many. It is on one of those AFI lists in 2008. The AFI's top 10 top 10 Uh, nominated for best fantasy movie now that seems like a strange name for a list and it does seem strange to also be the top of a list but i suppose it does need to be in the fantasy discussion uh why are we covering this movie lizzie did you did you set this up for us i sure did this is my first dealer's choice of 2024 and so had you seen this before yes yes i you know i did not actually grow up watching this movie. I feel like this is something that when I talk about how much I love it, there's an automatic assumption that I, that, you know, I think this movie was one when I, um, when it came out and, or excuse me, I think I was one 
when this movie came out. I like so the, this, just, the movie was one when I was born. When I was born, yeah. It's <laughs> like a natural assumption that like I just grew up on this movie. But I actually grew up on the song Magic Dance and never knew where it was from. I always listened to that and it was always something that was in the background and I never put two and two together. So I was a David Bowie fan far before I was ever even introduced to Labyrinth. And in college, my brother crashed with me for a little while. We were driving one day. He heard me have, I uh, had a magic dance in the car. He asked me if I had ever seen Labyrinth and my brother Ellis and I share this, this dual love of when somebody that we love has not seen a movie that we adore. We love making it an entire experience of mm. making sure that they watch it and being a part of it. Like we both really love that. So we went to this video store, rented it, and that's all she wrote. I mean, my life was like totally changed. I am a huge self-admitted Muppet fan, huge mm -hmm. Jim Henson fan. And so this just spoke to every fiber of my being. And then being able to see Magic Dance brought to life was just electrifying. So I've I'll stick with you it. for now is uh, you were introduced kind of late, so I don't know how frequently you've watched it, but now that it's being covered on the show, uh, what were your expectations coming in this time? Uh, my Honestly, I've seen this movie probably 20 times. I've seen it many, many times. I think my expectation going into it this time was that I watched it with my son, and it was the first time that we had ever watched it together. He's eight. And so I was kind of recreating the first experience of me watching it. So I had really high expectations. They met all of mine, but they, they sadly did not meet my sons. <laughs> with, with family and loved ones, that's bound to happen every once in a while. Um, yes. and, and may, maybe he'll turn the, the corner. Maybe he won't. But, let's hope. Uh, yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. Honestly. <laughs> There's so much fun to be had in this movie. Brian, what's your experience with Labyrinth? You know, I watched it several times as a young person um and i don't remember it being on purpose like i don't think my parents were like hey you need to watch labyrinth i think i kind of got into it at different points in time when it was televised or something like that i think i finally watched it in its entirety and it was probably right around the same time i was re-watching movies like uh never ending story there were a bunch of movies in that that i would put in this in this basket and I was watching them all. And I, I dig the genre in general. Um, like Lizzie was saying, you know, the Jim Henson, you know, Fraggle Rock. I still sometimes just put on the theme song to Fraggle Rock just to make me happy. Um, so, yeah, that was that was the basics of, of my experiences with it. I got really excited when uh, it was an option to try it again because it had been a while since I had watched it. And I always eager to, to give it another swing. Yeah, I was excited when it came across as an option, too. And the reason being, and I was lucky to be able to tell Lizzie this before we started recording, is that I probably have 20 or 30 watches of this under my belt. And uh, I'm holding up my phone for them to see. I've actually got the soundtrack downloaded on my phone. Yes. Uh, I, I listen to this while I'm cleaning the house. I listen to this if I've got a short drive. Uh, this style, uh, I think I've talked about it, especially with Russell, like uh, big Muppet head, big Henson guy. These are the things that like are very special to when you were growing up before CGI became what it is now, before Pixar was what it is. Something new, bright, spectacular. And, you know, this movie is older than I am. But th this like something that is different in this way, uh, even when uh, TV shows like Muppets Tonight or I, I believe they tried a, a Muppets like office style uh, TV show for a while there is that whatever they're willing to try, I'm willing to buy. And yep. th that it may not always be of the tip top, like highest tier, but that's okay. I'm, I'm comforted by their presence. And a movie like this is not made up of the Sesame street characters is not made up of the Muppets characters. It's something about like the creature studio and the magic that they can do. And I think this movie shows a lot of it off. So yeah, I, I did grow up with the movie. It was not like introduced to me. I caught it on TV and said, this is great. I like this. And uh, I was also describing earlier that I will mention this movie. And based on the response I get from my friend or my coworker, I, I will decide, oh yeah, you're my people. Of course you like this or oh, we need to get in the lab and figure out why you don't like this or why you haven't seen it, something like that. Um, so I had I had 
I, I know this movie like the back of my hand. So really the only change was, am I going to be able to find something about this experience that takes away from my lofty expectations? Because I, I know it and I like it already. So uh, we are going to get into you know, the things that we saw, we're going to get into our plot. And if you have not seen Labyrinth, you better turn us off and go watch it before we come back from this ad break, because uh, we have a plot summary coming and we don't want to spoil it for you. So see you on the other side. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason. And this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening. And welcome back. Hopefully you had time to watch from 1986 Labyrinth, uh, because if you didn't, we're about to spoil it. Lizzie, take it away. Sarah is a 16-year-old who is caught between fairy tales and teenage reality. She dreams of the Goblin King from her book to whisk her away and save her from her responsibilities at home, mainly her little brother Toby. One night, after feeling particularly tossed aside by her parents, she wishes aloud for the Goblin King to take away her baby brother. In steps Jareth, the Goblin King materialized. He invites Sarah to join him, and when she demands her brother back, he offers her a chance to find him deep within his labyrinth before the cock strikes thirteen. Sarah travels alone into the labyrinth, but not for long, as she makes enemies and friends while her intellect and nerve are put to the ultimate test. Sarah makes it to the goblin's castle, where she and Jareth have their final showdown. Sarah realizes that she has had the power all along to save her brother. Sarah wakes up at home with Toby peacefully in bed. Before she can question if it was all a dream, she's met with her all of her labyrinth friends for one more magic dance. That's sweet. What a sweet ending to that summary. Uh, me and Brian and Lizzie were kind of playing rock, paper, scissors to decide who was hosting the show tonight. Uh, so I said, hey, I can jump in here and I can host the show without doing any prep just because I know all stuff about it. And so I wanted to ask, with this world we're in, a fantasy setting. Like, no doubt, 100% fantasy. Uh, Lizzie, I'll start with you. Is there something about, as an adult and, like, observing it, it's like, this is all a creation of her imagination, though it's not so easily explained away like a dream. Does that make this unique here? I think so. I mean, there's, it's interesting that with it being her dream, because the world is very tricky. Like it's not the little worm in the beginning makes a point to Sarah, like saying you can't take anything for granted and like nothing Mm -hmm. is as it seems. And every step of the way, there's somebody willing to play a prank or a trick on her in order to throw her off course. So it's almost as if, if this was all Sarah's dream that you're really seeing in real time that she is having some genuine life struggles that are being projected out in this very tricky labyrinth. You know, it's not even so much the maze that of the labyrinth itself that is troubling her, but all of the little creatures inside that are making it almost impossible to stay on track. Yeah, there there are twists and turns figuratively and literally. Th- there's uh, everything is out to get you in a way. Um, and it's all sort of based on, I mean, this is technically a frame tale because we have the real world that we see where she is, we start the movie, she's reading from the book, she's reading lines, whether it is for a poetry reading, whether it's for theater class, there's maybe it's just that she loves this fantasy setting. And she is doing things pre smartphone in your hand where it's like, what do I have time to do? I'm going to go to the park 
and in my head rehearse what it would be like <laughs> to have this interaction with the Goblin King. And right. so th that's, that's a real cool nostalgic thing about it. And then we, we do return to the real world and she's got relationships with the real world. But Brian, what do you think about this idea of everything she encounters is something that in a way she has either read or created. It's like she is dealing with, with everything inside of her own imagination. I was telling my wife the other day, I just had had some really intense dreams the night before. And I was like, none of this is even anything close to what I'm dealing with right now. It's not a video game I've been playing. It's nothing I've been watching recently. Like this dream was so unique and so random like, I can't even tell you, like, I'm not sure what my mind's dealing with to construct this, but there it is. So I, I felt like that was a really poignant, you know, thing because I was like, well, you know, I just watched Labyrinth. So maybe constructing something completely unique and different in my brain was, was some sort of uh, <laughs> bounce off, but bounce off this. So I, the human mind is fascinating and the things it does to recuperate and you know to deal is is equally as uh, unique to the person having the dream or the fantasy or whatever as you know the next person so i mean it's a great idea and it's it's something that gets used in films and and it can literally lead you anywhere and i think with a lot of fantasy there there's like you're on a quest and there's a there's a, a force working against you or there is a, a, an ultimate good and an ultimate evil and you are on a side. But when we look at this, especially in retrospect, when we watch the whole thing, Jareth tells her, like, I've everything I've done, I've done for you. Everything you've asked, um, I've done. My existence is based on you, Lizzie. When our bad guy is really just sort of like almost an element of the subconscious, does it make this whole thing way more interesting to think about? It, when you look at it from an adult perspective, absolutely. Because if you look at what her real world is like, she's so her family dynamic is that she's got her dad and her stepmom. And so it, we assume that her little brother Toby is her stepbrother. And she is, she comes home after rehearsing. She's, you know, she's late. She's, she knows that she's going to get in trouble. And sure enough, she does kind of get fussed at. So they try to set this dynamic with her family that they put a lot of stock in Sarah in helping out with Toby. And I think on some level, Sarah kind of feels like she's morphed into that Cinderella role per se. So like in her real life, I think she feels that she is more of a vehicle for everybody else's success, but that no one in her family is That's actually concerned with her as like an actual legitimate member of the family. And so I think Jareth is kind of that manifestation of even though he is a bad guy, like his obsession is her. And it's almost like she's poured all of her desires and of the flesh almost and not in a in a like a I sensual know, way but in more of like a uh like her her selfish desires is to just be adored and coveted and so it's almost like oh, jareth is wow. like the personification of that almost and then she has to go through this whole journey to realize that like no she needs toby like toby is necessary she's gonna fight for him that is interesting. Brian, the, what Lizzie just touched on was this sort of uh, psychosomatic or th this emotion personified is what Jareth is. And so I'm not going to ask you the question. Tell me more about all of the teen emotions that are personified <laughs> in the labyrinth. But do you do you like the idea that this is now way more than just girl in fantasy setting on quest that we have? This movie teaches you lessons, doesn't it? Yes. And, and I'll also say this, that without it necessarily being evident, you know, you don't go into what she listens to or if she listens to music or anything like that. But I do think there's a, a nod to the audience in, you know, this, this is something people do that they have artists that they fantasize about. And again, I don't mean this in a sensual way, just as a, like, if, if you had that sort of adoration 
uh, shown back on you. Like if you're a fan, you get the fandom, you know, looking mm-hmm. back at you. So I do feel like the use of David Bowie and uh, as that figure kind of uh, turns the mirror back on the the watcher also like, you know, we're going to use this as the vehicle and you know, who, who would be in this spot if it were you? Uh, that's cool. I do know oh that she has, uh, at, she's at least a little bit of a fan of the Broadway show cats because that's a poster on her wall. It sure is. And then there's another poster of something very 80s. Uh, it was like written in blood or something. It's like Scarlet Witch or something. I don't know if that one was real. But uh, that that's a cool way of looking at it. It's like personify your adoration. So w- what do you need? And you think about teenagers. Like what do they need? You know, I, I looked at the frame tale myself and I did not think. <clears throat> I, I think they had to try with very little time. With very little time how to create the world that she's dissatisfied with um even even the presence of the word stepmother means something uh that that things might not be perfect for her um and we are reminded way later in the movie uh that she is let's let's just assign an age i don't know what the age is but stepmother says you should be dating at your age so let's just say she's 16 years old is that at, at 16 years old, she has a room filled with stuffed animals and playthings mm-hmm. and uh, costume jewelry. And th- it's not completely out of the question that somebody would still hold on to these things. But her life seems to revolve around it. Uh, and th- th- these possessions are of, of hers. Uh, so then, very quickly, within 14 minutes, we are in the labyrinth. We're there. And uh, she, Jareth issues the challenge, and she stumbles upon Hoggle. Uh, so what, when your first experience with, oh, boom, we're out of the real world, we're in this new place, it happens so fast. Uh, Lizzie, are you, like, as you rewatch it, are you excited to get into, okay, now the fun starts? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, this is a great length. It's amazing. I love movies. Like you you coined the term like a tight 90. It it's perfect. Um, and I really think that they, they laid all the groundwork that they need. You know, they honestly make it so perfect. At one point when Sarah is storming upstairs in the real world, the stepmother says to Sarah's dad, she's like, no matter what I do, she's always going to see me as the wicked stepmother. Like they just make sure to very quickly Mm-hmm. drive home how Sarah's feeling and everything is really hyperbolic all the way that she's behaving, but you really do like, so all of the meat is in the labyrinth. And so I love that they don't waste any time. They set the stage and then immediately the challenge is made. You don't really need to know that much about Sarah ahead of time, other than this is a girl who's about to go on a journey and Hopefully she'll rise to the challenge and honestly does some growing up along the way. Brian, do you think it was a shock to audiences to see that as she enters the fantasy realm? I mean, we have these funny little clues where, you know, he says something like you have 13 hours to get through. Right. And it's a special clock with 13 hours on it. But immediately you meet Hoggle. And what's he doing? He's peeing in a fountain using like a poison sprayer to knock fairies to the ground. Like, I think that this movie subverts expectations there for the audience likely to be in the theaters for what kind of movie am I in for? Uh, do you feel the same way? Uh, I mean, I think it's a hilarious start and it, it, it speaks to that, like the immaturity level of her uh, to start it. And, you know, it's, you know, it's the, I think it was first Corinthians quote about being a child, becoming a man and putting away childish things. Like that's that's her character arc in this. This is a coming of age story in a way, and you see that with her pulling things off of her mirror in the end of it, and then you know just let us know if you need us. Well, of course I need you. Er, you know, <laughs> party time. So, yeah. You know, it, you know, it's a you know there there are two sides to that coin, and you know I feel like she's kind of embracing maturity and embracing, um, you know, a new understanding in her life but also not really willing to give up the you know she still wants to hear the sil- silver bell jingle at christmas time yes i think that's sweet i think that growing up doesn't necessarily mean that you have to you know especially kids these days i love like the tiktoks of like what i was doing in middle school versus what like kids today in middle school are doing because it 
it feels crazy to watch, but Mm -hmm. it, um, it, I think there is something to be said though, about making decision, making the decision to grow up and allowing yourself really that time to transition out of that, where you can still really enjoy the childhood things, but you're no longer idolizing them in the way that you used Mm -hmm. to. And you're letting yourself be open to the possibility of finding new things that you like that feel a little bit more age appropriate and just kind of finding your voice in that way. And I think it's fun to be able to watch Sarah go on that journey while still maintaining that appreciation for all things that still have that tether on our heart, just like we do. You know, we love this movie, honestly. So it's like art imitating life in a sense of when we watch it, we have a nostalgic for it, even though we're adults. There's a lot of things in fantasy that remind you that adventure of all kinds is fun. And the rule about D&D at our table is you can play whatever you want as long as your character wants to go on an adventure. We don't want you to play someone that wants to sit on the couch. We don't want you to play someone that's uninterested in the the voyage. And so when I think of this, is it's it's a big adventure through the labyrinth with all the perils that come with it. And so adventure changes as you age, the things that you are excited to do. I'm very lucky with my mm-hmm. job that every week, every day presents a new adventure because I've got, I've got to go all over this hill country area of Texas and solve new problems. That's great for me. Uh, but new adventures could be how you handle parenting. New adventures could be how you handle mm-hmm. your relationships. And in this case, the adventure, though it is framed as like growing up, I grew up. And she does, like, kind of at a snap of a finger, quote unquote, says that she grows up. Uh, But, you know, nothing happens overnight quite like that. But the lessons the movie teaches you, they kind of hit it ham-fisted. She, and I think that's maybe important for the young audience, is she'll say out loud, oh, it goes on forever and ever. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm just taking for granted that it does. Could have been inner monologue, could have been done through uh, a, a, a clever shot of her face, but instead it's said out loud so that the parents can explain what that means. And yes. then the worm says, oh, you can't take anything for granted. And that's <laughs> kind of where we are. Uh, then we have puzzle solving. We have um, literally fighting off monsters and stuff like that. Uh, friendship. Uh, all all types of things. And then, you know, the idea of, you know, this potential uh, exotic lust of whatever that, whatever David Bowie is. And so I guess we've made it 35 epi- minutes into the episode without talking about him. But Brian, tell me about Bowie as Jareth. I, I wish that I could have the headspace to tell you what Bowie meant to people when Bowie was really Bowie. Mm-hmm. Like I understand he didn't die until the late, you know, 20 teens. I think that was right. Right. But January um, 10th, 2016. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I wish I could, you know, give you that. Like, like I've seen what Bowie fans feel about Bowie. So I can tell you based on their reactions that this was of high import. I don't think I have ever, cared about a musical artist in the same way that people cared about Bowie. I don't think there's maybe been an artist ever that cared about a musician the way that Bowie fans care about Bowie. And I was actually talking to Russ about this recently where like, I I appreciate that level of fandom, but I've never had it myself. Like there's nobody that's that important to me. And Bowie was one of those people like that, that not only was he commercially successful, but he, he also had more than a cult following of religious support that mm-hmm. listened to him in that way. And, you know, it, I, I'd say maybe the closest thing is now Taylor Swift. Like Taylor yeah. Swift is probably the closest probably thing we've comparison, yeah. since Bowie. So I mean, that's, that's heavy. And, you know, I don't really listen to Taylor Swift all that much, but again, I've never had that obsessive, like I haven't done anything this month, but listening to, you know, 
whatever's you know total right. discography like I, that's just not how i yeah. listen to music even though i love music so i i can't accurately answer your question in a way that I, I'm sure sooner or later we're going to have a Bowie fan. Like, and I use air quotes right here. I know people can't see that, but just so you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, Oh, you don't even know you're, you're that fan. And I appreciate you. And, and you're right. We don't know yeah. that in the comments, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I can't, I can't give you the correct answer because I haven't felt what those people felt. And I I agree with you with the Taylor Swift. I would say maybe Beyonce as well, being a complete culture setter. Um, and I would say that the devotion to the dead, the Grateful Dead, is maybe at the same level. But I may I may be off the mark. Uh, I will say like my favorite artists, my favorite bands. I kind of don't care about them as people. I care about their music. And so we're lucky to have David Bowie's voice in here, and we'll and we'll talk about the music later. But let's talk about his performance as Jareth the Goblin King. I've already alluded to that he is a manifestation of what Sarah wants. And his costuming, his makeup, his line delivery, um, and just his the way that his part is written, I think, is maybe one of the more memorable things about this movie. You have incredible creature work and set design. Uh, the The... Yeah, the frame story might not be as strong, uh, and the reason why she has to go after Toby is uh, pretty pretty clearly put. But uh, Lizzie, as far as like sticking in your mind, I, I imagine Jareth the Goblin King sticks in your mind. Oh my gosh, absolutely! Like I said, I had listened to Magic Dance before I had seen this movie. So that sticks into me, but nothing quite like the very first time that you see Jareth. And I have to imagine that there was somebody on set that their job was to just <laughs> throw glitter <laughs> at, like in, in David Bowie's general direction. And it's, it's the glitter. It's the, his hair with his bangs. Mm -hmm. It's just the his shadow. face. Like, Yes, the eyeshadow. Yes. And he just has this, this smirk on his face, kind of like, you know, those memes that came out with Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka yeah. in the scene where he's oh, doing like the that. Yeah, tell, yes. tell, me, tell me about your problems. <laughs> yeah. no, but it's like, it's like yeah. condescending look on his face. Like he almost mm. kind of has that, but in an, in, in with the same charm where you don't feel you necessarily like he's looking down on you in an offensive way, but you can still tell like he is the goblin King and he knows that about himself. And there's just a quiet confidence that David Bowie has. That is so even in that whole get up. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the, whole, it's just so magnanimous. Like you just feel like he feels like I woke up like this. <laughs> like I literally, like I didn't have to sit in a chair for four hours to get all this hair and makeup done. This is me. I am Jareth. Like I just have to imagine that he was so eccentric and yeah, he I, walked in with that outfit and that cod piece. Yes, they, they did not and need wardrobe so for him. Effortless. Like he just, everything about him. Like I know the, when he's talking to Sarah, like I know that that's kind of like a behind the scenes thing where the, the hands moving the globe, like aren't actually his hands, mm -hmm. but just the way that he's talking while that's happening. And he's just, he's like, yeah, like come, come with me. Like, why not? Like come with oh, me. It's like, it's forever. It's not long at all. Like just come. Ooh. And uh, I just, I love him. I know that, there were some other people that were potentially up for that role. And I honestly cannot even fathom them. It like David Bowie is like, it's, it's him or bust. He makes it so fun to watch. I think that uh, another thing I'll add to that is, you know, cu coming from a, a pop icon that really made androgyny a thing at a time where it probably wouldn't have been a thing otherwise. Um, you're you're completely right like david bowie let's say you knew him personally he could show up at your house wearing anything you wanted to and you'd be like what's up dave yeah like yeah you're like, 
and, and, and owns it. Like he, he changed his persona like other people change their clothes and he owned every single part of it. And it, that's why it was so cool because, you know, I'd say he's maybe the closest person I've ever seen in pop culture that could be everything to everyone. What a great I way would agree with that. that. And, you know, we all know what it feels like to, to, to watch somebody try a look or kind of like a new era per se, and it just feel forced. And yeah, with doing, him, David? it's, yeah, it's like, it's just so effortless with, with David Bowie. Like he just, whether he is Jareth or he is, the special American scientist that's able to transport top hats for <laughs> Hugh Jackman. Like no matter who he's playing, I forget his name. He's Tesla. In that. Uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla. Tesla. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. He's, um, he's just so effortless in every single role he plays. You, he, he really, it's beyond committing. He like truly just transforms. And, and I'll say one thing on that. Just, just to your point. He wore that suit. Yeah, he did. In the prestige. <laughs> like that. Yeah. He, gosh. He wore that suit. Like, I, I'm not sure if I've ever seen a suit get worn like he wore that suit. Uh, he is kind of untouchable or out of earthly reach in a way in the prestige. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Angier, have you considered the cost? Money is no option. Yes, but have you considered the cost? He knows things that are grander and greater than what has been mm -hmm. explained. As Jareth, th this Jareth character, he can turn into an owl. <clears throat> he creates these crystal things that become magic. He can, uh, he has telepathy. He can talk through the space. He can create these hallucinations, create poisons. He, he, he is, in a way, in, in this imagination world, um, both omniscient and omnipresent. And like, these are, these are things that are like, he's extremely powerful as a literary character in this book or in this world. And what you said, Lizzie, like, but come with me, like he is willing to like, Hey, I understand. I, I, I am the powerful being here, but I will play with you. And well, I th I she wants to be played with. Go ahead, Brian. I, I think you hit the I, I think you hit the nail right there. Like you're the, the message is your imagination is omniscient. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. But he's rather than there has to be something said about, you know, you were Brian saying like if if, if there was a certain like celebrity or role model that was like coveting you. It's like kind of like a, a fantasy of every young teenager. And um, because the reality of that is that like, usually, you know, if, like we, we have like the tiger beat posters on our wall and like, we're the ones like, you know, having the fantasies about the, the people. So it's, it's a total role reversal, but juxtaposed with this like overall ultimate power. And so it is, really interesting because he has that Achilles heel, which is Sarah. And the, the defeat is not in combat or, I mean, really like the, the point of her journey is, is to get Toby back a, a decision. She immediately regretted. However, that's not really the heart of this movie. Um, we're not, we're not interested in, does she get the baby back? Oh, that's a win. We're interested in her journey here and her confrontation with Jareth, who, when she does confront him, uh, he uses these sort of mind puzzles, the, the MC Escher set and what like scene. Uh, he, he's still doing what he can in a way to either like confuse her or to make her feel like, hey, you know, be in service to me here. I'm the, I'm the guy on the inside, but I need to be in, in control. Uh, which, by the way, would be an, uh, now that I think about it, would be a great like plot device in Inside Out Two or Inside Out Three or whatever. Um, yes. But the idea that uh, like <laughs> this emotion needs out, he says, "I can't live within you." Yeah, I, 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 this is all. It makes for a good lyric, but when we are getting in our heads about it, it's like this is really pretty deep, deeper than a children's yeah. movie probably would be. So, so Brian. I think this movie counts as 
children's movie with stuff for the parents. But normally stuff with the parents comes with humor. In this case, we're talking about stuff with the parents comes with like, oh, that's kind of a, a, a little deeper. I would say it goes over most kids' heads, some of the stuff we're talking about, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, I do. But I also, I am a strong believer that children's movies, again, audience, I'm using air quotes here. Children's movies hit harder back then. Like the stuff we watched Absolutely. as kids would never, ever fly for, you know, a children's movie today. I, I mm. actually think this movie would likely get like a strong PG, maybe even PG-13 rating. Mm. Granted, it doesn't have any language, so it may be saved that that fate. But um, I, I don't know. Uh, there's a there's a darkness to this film that you wouldn't necessarily see in a children's movie today. And, and that's what a lot of, I mean, we talked about it kind of in hook there's, you know, a violence level to it that all, although there's the cheeky, you know, paintballs and whatnot that it, you watch movies like that. And this is not me just, you know, tooting the horn for my childhood over someone else's childhood. Right. I just feel like the kid gloves are really, really tighter now than they used to be. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It almost is like. Jareth is it's kind of like we've talked about like the personification of um I've been reading with Wilder the like we've started at the beginning of the Bible so we're in the Genesis and I just read him the Cain and Abel story and it's like this idea of like you know God saying like be careful cuz sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you and uh it's almost like Jareth is like that personification of like he wants her to give in to all of these desires. And the moment that she claims like you have no power over me, then he really does well, just and he, turn to you. He knew the whole time. Dissolves. He knew the whole time he had no power over her. Yeah. The, the only way he could accomplish his goals was to, was to follow through with her own wish, which was to take the, the, the baby away. You're absolutely right, Brian, when you said like there, there's darkness here that, that is like visible if you know how to look. But when you are looking at just face value, uh, you are bombarded with so many fun and colorful things, vibrant spaces, silly lines, jokes that are, I'm not going to say they're hit or miss, they're just, they're for a certain audience. Uh, it's the same way that, you know, some, some directors will will have their own brand of humor and 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 henson and muppet studios always has too they've always had their uh some people might elect not to have the punchline and have a face like a facial gesture do it like like make the joke for you but but like the henson studios they're going to do it so you have uh you know jareth says something menacing <laughs> well laugh and they all laugh after him. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, that's, that's good. That's a stylistic thing of this. And speaking of the style, that's where uh, we've just got all these fun little vignettes and goblins and dwarves and things. I did not do this while I was watching. Uh, while Lizzie was doing her uh, plot summary, I just started typing, what are all the different little things that we see and I just, I, I didn't even go in order, but I'm going to say them to you right now. And, and Lizzie, I want you to, to pick one to elaborate on here. The Helping Hands, The Lie Truth Door, Hoggle, Ludo, Sir Didymus, The Man with the Hat Who Asked for the Donation, The Junk Lady, The Goblin Knights, The False Alarms, The Big Faces in the Wall, The Cleaners, and The Worm. And I probably missed five or six. There's all, you don't have many movies at all with this many stops along the way and they're not long stops but they're all pretty memorable do you have one that's most memorable lizzie yes my favorite is always the lie and truth door there that was always my favorite when like, it was my favorite when i watched it my first time and it continues to be still one of us always tells the truth and one of us always yes. lies. it's such a complicated idea but it's this idea where of, she goes over to the other door and says, Would he will he tell, tell me, me that this is the door yeah. that leads to certain death? He's like, yes. He's like, okay, so it's this door then that leads that, that I want to take that leads to certain death. And then this is the door here. And it's this idea. Of, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like such like a, but it does make sense. And um, I got to jump in here I, and say, 
I've never understood it. I <laughs> consider myself a smart guy. The, the <laughs> one always lies and one always tells the truth. There's a lot of ways that you can stumble on it. In this instance, it's, it's, there's not two. There's actually four. Because there's the ones on top of the shield, and then there's the ones on the bottom of the shield. That's it's right. the ones on the bottom of the shield that give them the premise. It's the ones on top that answer. So that means, oh, speaking of the, the door knockers, an, another another stop along the way. Yeah. Uh, so so that means that if, if in the traditional sense of this puzzle, the person explaining the premise of the puzzle is a clue as to whether or not you can believe the puzzle. Like I said, I consider myself a smart guy, but I've never actually gotten this. And the idea that she comes with it so quick is like, is this her growing up or is her, is, does she just have a quick wit? I don't know what right? it is. Right. It's, it's always been tough for me, but this also gives a chance for, for them to show off the humor. And, and in this instance, it was uh, a lot of ways, but uh, the, the one is he says the same thing. I don't know. I've never understood it. Um, <laughs> and the, the other one says right before certain death, boom, 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 boom. like they, they are yes. doing hammy things. Uh, oh, what a lie. Oh, what a lie. <laughs> I, I, I've said that so many times as an adult. Oh, what a lie. Uh, Brian, do you see, like, the, the humor along these is where it, it I'm going to say it leans towards, like, a, a child's perspective, but uh, this is a funny movie. So, I, I've always been a massive fan of Alice in Wonderland, and there's a ton of that, you know, packed in here. And homages uh, with, for sure, yeah. Yeah, riddle, rid, rid, yeah riddles and wordplay, and, and that's always something that, you know, a, a, a deep rabbit. I probably say this is a deep rabbit hole to go down a lot. And, and that's one of the <laughs> yeah. things that I really love about this movie is, you know, it kind of takes that, it puts its twist on it. And yeah, I, every time she came to Two Doors, I was like, this is awesome. This is going to be awesome. No matter what happens here, it's going to be awesome. Um, and, uh, I, I don't have a favorite door. I just got excited. as like, Ooh, there's a door part coming up. Yeah. Well, bec because you knew it was a, a chance. I I'd say this movie shines with these little micro interactions, these, these little small bit mm -hmm. characters. Um, agrees. You, you might say Lizzie, how many times have we mentioned character development, but you might say that a lot of these little guys you meet along the way, sometimes, the media or sometimes the movie is just well look at all these little guys and that's enough none of these guys are really yeah. developed that much so, so yeah you've got the the man with the bird hat who the joke is that his hat is tired of being his hat and his advice was bad he did not give any advice the false alarms you, beware this is not the way Th those guys right <laughs> They're, Please let me do it. <laughs> right, well, and that's where all of these give a chance for a little bit of humor, right? And, and yeah. so, um, as I was watching this, I'm, I'm I'm not laughing out loud, but I'm just chuckling, like, yeah, this is this is good stuff. This is like Muppet level stuff, and I and I dig it. Um, and some of these things are real feats, visual masterpieces. Uh, Lizzie, the Helping Hands is there. That's what I was is there anything too. more fantastic as far as an effect? Then the helping hands. The helping hands are so crazy. I will never forget the first time seeing it. Like the way that they're able to perfectly match up the cadence of the voice with the hands. Yeah. And then every face is completely different than the next. Like you have people with mustaches, you'll have sometimes like a kind of like a baby shark motion having it's unbelievable. And you can't completely tell if they actually are helpful or not. And that's kind of the fun in it. They, they're almost playing with her in a way. And so, you know, at first you think like, you know, she goes down, she's like, wait, 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 wait. Like, do you want to go up or down? And she said, down. She chose and down. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, you can't Too completely tell if they're good or bad. But honestly, that's what, it, in a way, you could kind of argue that nobody in the labyrinth is completely good or completely bad. They're all kind of yeah. living off of their own set of rules. And they, the people who Sarah has befriended are people who she like have just chosen to help her and then kind of see the good in her. And, and that part of them almost gets activated a little bit, but like Hoggle, for example, in, you know, the, I forget his name, but you mentioned him. It's like the dog on a dog. Sir Didymus. And 
So generous. Yeah. So it's like everybody is almost living by their own little set of rules and then just decides to be a good Samaritan. Well, I, let me jump in here real quick. There, there was a, a thing I noticed in this rewatch where um, it's like the parable of the two wolves. Um, yeah, where one's good, inside, one's yeah. evil, and the one that you feed is the one that wins. Mm-hmm. Well, she gives each of these um, these uh, companions, she gives them love and trust and friendship, mm-hmm. and they what end up pushing her through the labyrinth. And what she doesn't succumb to is her fears, her angers, her distrust, her hatred, it's keen. and. So it just it that that's something that really jumped out at me. Now clearly this isn't something that I understood or even knew about as a you know young person watching this the first time. But man, it smacked me across the face on this watch. You know, Brian, yeah. you were the lucky one because Lizzie brought up our companions in this sense, which he mentioned Hoggle and Didymus and Ludo too. Uh, Didymus and Ludo are very brave. Hoggle is not. Brian, tell me, I think Hoggle might be one of the more interesting characters in a children's movie, mainly because of his conflict. He's the one that is dealing with the most conflict, I would say, with his, uh, and he says it, I'm a coward, and Jareth scares me. No, he's, we're not going to talk about Ambrosius. Ambrosius <laughs> is also a coward. <laughs> Oh, he was oh, given an ultimatum. Like, the only way to make him walk fight. Across the steppy swamp. I don't want to fight anything. <laughs> Just Why close you your eyes. Me into this, man. <laughs> Just a a dog. Dog. <laughs> Sorry, your your question. Uh, I, all I was all I was getting at was like Hoggle's character is one that is developed, and and we mm-hmm. see his struggle with what is right. And uh, God, the way that you said it, the uh, like. Sarah fed the good wolf in him, and he's still so conflicted. And it, the, it, first of all, he's the audience knows it because he says it. But second of all, even if he didn't say it, that's such an advanced animatronic for his dwarf face to change and to show compassion, to show fear, to show embarrassment, all the stuff. I think Hoggle gave us a real opportunity for development here, Brian. Well, I, I choose to look at it this way. Every single character in this is a manifestation of of the main character herself. So Hoggle is showing fear and cowardice, and he's doing it so she doesn't have to. That's the part of her doing it. Hmm. No, I see that. Never thought about it that way, but that's actually a really good point. It's like. He, Jareth is the personification of all of her desires, but Hoggle is the personification or like Muppetification of like all of her biggest fears. It's how, you know, he keeps holding up. (laughs) I I can give you everything you want. All you have to do is embrace the selfishness and you can have you the way, you know, you really want you. That's Mm -hmm. the desire the that's the dark side you know you know take uh, your weapon and strike me down <laughs> oh there you go pa- past all of the fun smaller vignettes i think we have the two most powerful back to back before the goblin city because the fight inside the goblin city is a romp and it's silly but right before it you have these two and lizzie i'll, I'll, I'll toss it up to you as to which one you want to uh, really delve in on you have uh, Trevor Jones wrote an incredible piece of music called Hallucination, which is the song that plays as Jareth has the four glass balls rotating them in his hand and turning them into bubbles that go and shoot across mm-hmm. the world. And as she's just eaten the fruit, the fruit that makes you forget, speaking of Hook, Brian, uh, in some of these some of these child movies from this time period, forgetfulness or like... That is the ultimate enemy. It, Neverland makes you forget. Never forget. That's right. And the idea is, the thing that almost stopped her is this almost lull, this hallucination into this thing that she thought she wanted. So uh, he, th- this hallucination piece happens where she uh, goes to the masquerade ball. Mm-hmm. An incredible music video on its own. Yes. Followed by 
another heavy personification and a very meaningful scene, which is when she meets the junk lady and she's introduced back to what she thinks is her room filled with all of her stuff. So, Lizzie, which of these is like the impactful one for you? Oh, oh my goodness. It's a hard I one, think sorry. It, that's really, really hard. I, I think let's expand on the fantasy because I think that that is this moment where first and foremost, the thing that struck me the most was when she catches a glimpse of herself and she sees how beautiful she is because she is really very beautiful mm-hmm. in that scene. You know, she's wearing like the really pretty dress and her makeup's done and she looks probably, I imagine what a young girl at that age would look like going to like prom or something. And so at first she's really caught up in the, like I could have this aspect, but at the same time you can also tell that she also is very cognizant that this is wrong. And like, I'm she, or at the very least that she is confused, like that That she knows that on some level that this isn't right. And like something feels off. I can't quite put my finger on it, but something is wrong. And it's, uh, it's such an interesting moment because it's like, she is having a taste of what she has wanted this entire time. And now that she's had it, she's having to face with a really take a really hard look in the mirror and realize that she's been wanting all the wrong things. Yeah. I'm so glad that you, that you, I'm not going to say you had that locked and loaded, but that is such an impactful scene. The way that you mentioned, like, this has got to be like what a girl thinks of prom at the time. There's probably that if there was not a consultant, because we know that Henson and his group understand children, but if there was not like a teen girl consultant as to like, what are, what's, what, what are we looking to get here? And yes, giant, uh, giant billowy dress and, yes. and, and, and uh, <laughs> the, the hair and the hair piece, like, like the, the, the jewelry, yes. inside, it was, was like that. I paid attention to that this time. Uh, and then you've got this kind of like uh, masquerade ball thing that is fantasy that does exist in the real world. So it's a fantasy within a fantasy inside of a floating bubble. Um, and she, she, the way you say, it, like she's confused, uh, or because I don't, I, I think th- there's maybe one third of it where she wants to give in to this fantasy. Yes, not half and half. It, it, there is a. Well, uh, it wasn't oh, yeah, go fun. Ahead. It wouldn't be tempting. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, well, that's right. And, and speaking of the temptation, uh, we, we we know that she breaks out and comes to and is immediately led back to comfort of oh, her room with with this is all you need, dear. Uh, the first time the first time I noted uh, noticed this particular detail was was on the sixth, seventh, eighth watch. Like it was way later, but. The junk lady starts stacking all of her possessions on her back. Mm-hmm. And it starts growing and growing and growing before, hey, to the rescue comes Didymus and Ludo to knock the, the walls down. But she's, she makes that choice. Too. Like, we see the grow up. She says, no, I don't want this stuff. Get it off of me. Uh, so yes. like, we're, we're able to oh, see that quite a bit. Commercialism. And <laughs> exactly that that's what the junk lady is personifying here is like, right, you, don't you right. need all these things don't you need all these things uh well also in, incredible music here uh did you did you find yourself like oh this is this is taking me back i really have always loved chili down that was like the part that i loved so much when i was younger and i don't know if i know all the words but it's like na 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 and like they're like like all the clapping and like, it's just so fun. Don't got and no, that problems, was, no problems, yeah, no problems, <laughs> no shoes to worry about. And like, it's just such a no fun song. But also estate. there's like a really amazing harmony in it too, as well. Like it's actually like, it's a goofy song, but it is very like Bob Marley esque with like, this really beautiful harmony to it. Mm-hmm. Like it actually is like a legitimate song with rhythm and texture. And I, I really love it. And I feel like people sleep on that song. They don't really give it the, the accolades that it deserves. But my, I will say to that point though, that was the part that gave my son like the ultimate nightmare. Like he okay. actually made us turn it off. Like he yes. was so bothered because there's so like all these little, creature like orange creatures that keep ripping off their limbs and they're trying to take sarah's head off and they just that was his limit hey, man, he could not handle anymore. this 
that yeah, comes to my mind. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's only eight. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, but Brian, you're absolutely right. Like that was that kind of stuff. Like we just dismissed, like we didn't even yeah. like pr- process that if that was, just, yes. Oh. So we're like, I mean, yeah, that's kind of crazy, but like, but now kids, it's like they're, they have like trauma that they have to unpack after watching stuff like that. So right. like, it's, right. it really is just, so different. I tried so hard to ha- see if Wilder would push through it, but he just would not. And so I was like, okay. I, I actually back. remember having a, fa- a family member that was like, I can't believe you took him to see Nightmare Before Christmas. And I'm like, really? that movie was awesome. Yeah. And they were like, oh, I saw it. It was just, ah. and I was just like, yeah, really? I'm actually so, having a hard time thinking about what could be inappropriate in that movie. I, uh, yeah, I think like I mean, very- I know, I know I had seen, I had already seen Edward Scissorhands mm-hmm. and you know, I mean, Burton's movies are, are fairly dark, but again, yeah. you know, Batman, Batman returns. I remember seeing those as a kid and I was oh, just like, this stuff. Is- yeah, I mean, none of that, all oh, that stuff. Yeah. Just like, I don't know. Ooh. It just, it, but I, I get it that it, when I see what comes out as a children's movie now, and if you, you know, put in Edward scissor hands there. I'm like, Ooh. yeah, like there's nothing bad in Edward scissor hands. I think dark. that movie is, it's dark, but it's kind of darling. I think that movie is kind of sweet. Of like it's, there's like some sweet moments in it legitimately. And I never remembered anything scary about it as a kid, but I remember revisiting it as an adult and having that appreciation. Edward scissor hands is a Netflix right. and chill movie for me. I actually agree. I think that's a great one. It's just very sweet. He cuts people's hair. He makes the fun animals. Yeah, you know, he, he really loves his master, I guess. Is that the right way to put it? Um, but his, <laughs> I, I, uh, did, <laughs> I need to, I, I would hire him as my gardener in a heartbeat. <laughs> I can't keep up with all this Yeah. Make something pretty. Go at So, so the, that, that's not the first time I've heard that about Chili Down and the fire gang with the fire yes. rays is that that's the part I was scared of or that's the part my kids hate. And I suppose I understand. I just know that, like, I did not feel that same way. These guys are fun. And and that's what they're singing about. Chilly down with us. Think small with the fire gang, is what they say. Yes. Yeah. uh, You know, (laughs) uh, when things get too tough, when your chin is dragging on the ground, like, they're just like, just have fun. And their whole thing is having fun at the detriment of everything else. And getting away from them is good for Sarah. The thing is, Sarah was showing us as the audience and maybe to the, the children out there that like, oh, I'm not really down with this either. Maybe it's because they were trying to take off her head. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, They're but, trying to get my kid to smoke reefer. <laughs> the, 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 the fire game. We're like the trees gang, man. The smoke gang, man. Yeah. It's like, just put up your feet. Like, it's fine. You don't need to go to the castle. There get is lazy. something they say. Yeah. <laughs> get blazed with the fire gang. There is something that they say that is akin to like voodoo or um, akin to uh, like bad juju. They say the word, the phrase bad hep. Uh, bad, huh. bad hep is a, is a phrase I learned from them. Um, and so th- there was a like music consultant. Like, this is kind of, it's a very special song. And really, here's another thing. That whole scene is meant to show off what the creature studio can do in many ways uh in 1977 with the muppet movie the thing that was special was look we can make kermit ride a bike and you cannot see us whoa serious and then they're all riding bikes and that was innovation um then you have with the fire gang you have uh their heads popping off and the the beaks can still move and you have the one guy who's tapping his foot and then his foot starts tapping away from him. That's yeah. all done with some kind of like primitive green screen. And you can tell so hard nowadays, but it sure didn't bother me as a kid. Um, but like so, the, the way that they contort themselves into like flamingo and camel looking creatures that pop off of one another. Um, I imagine that would have been difficult for Jennifer Connelly to act uh, with all of this stuff going on, because it's it, it, who knows what it's going to look like in post. But, <laughs> Probably. But yeah, they were. I doing was really a lot scared of, at one point. Yeah, 
they were doing a lot of stuff to show off, and I, I thought that was a, a fun way to show things off. Um, well, there, there's so much of this movie I could still talk about, uh, but I'd rather bring that up in our superlative section. Are you guys ready? Yes. Absolutely. I, I wanted to say one more thing on that. Um, this rewatch really gave me one other thing. I I truly revere Jennifer Connelly as an actress. I think she's ac- excellent. But this movie was like listening to an audiobook where the person doing it hadn't ever done an audiobook before and it started really stiff and ended very smooth. Are you, are you talking about like her? Did anybody, like, I, I felt like she came into it uh, almost uh, overacting it in a way and once she got comfortable and was around the director actors, it, like I, I felt like it ended with her better than it started. Did that, anybody else can, feel it? I can appreciate that. I think I will argue that I think that they over dramatized her kind of teenage flare ups in the real world. I, would I agree think with just that. to try to do the best that they could in a really short amount of time, just to show her like how conflicted and kind of like hurting she was inside. I think they just tried to kind of go full force with that. So that might've been more thanks, of like thanks, her actual thanks, direction thanks. rather mm-hmm. than like her actual acting. I, I also think okay. that um, if you were to act as a, we'll say a lost or tossed about conflicted young girl that that would come off. If you did a good job at that, it would present the same emotions that you might be describing. And the hardest thing about it is, and I never know schedules and stuff like this, but the hardest part, you know, they shoot every, every, everybody shoots things out of order. So it's hard to know what, what was the first thing shot compared to the last. Uh, Do we know, is this her debut? Was this her in introducing Jennifer Connelly? I was actually. I think so. That that's that that was my assumption with that statement. Yeah, I I think I remember something like that. Maybe she had like some commercials or some light TV work before, but it's something I I did not know. But you know, it, it's interesting. You, you see her grow up, and she's still you know still a knockout to this day. And, oh yes, but I, uh, you, you that's see that's why I say. Really revere right. her as an actress but she's still got like the the baby fat in her cheeks is, is what's what's so yes. so like apparent it's like the, the casting is, is just about perfect with her um and really i moved on to superlatives because of the time not because i felt as if oh we don't need to talk about jennifer connelly but i think her performance is is great uh and her it, kingdom it, it truly <laughs> wasn't a knock. No, no, it truly isn't a knock on her performance. I just wanted to give kudos that where, you know, if, if it started one way and she really came in and really like found her place and her stride to do it in one movie, it, sometimes it takes people five, six, seven movies yeah. to really get there. And I felt like by the end of the movie, she was a lot more seamless in her part than she was at the beginning. Well, I would say that I don't know what rep- the reputation for George Lucas as executive producer would be in terms of cultivating young talent in that sense. But if there was anybody who could put the ultimate care into taking care of their child actor, it would be Jim Henson. Mm. Agreed. So if there's growth there that is objective to see, like you're saying, and I'm not disagreeing, uh, 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 but uh, then we would probably have to give some credit to to that guy who understood children's minds and understood uh, how how to talk with people the way that he did. Um, okay, well, uh, we are ready for our superlatives, and Lizzie, I'm going to start with you. Who's the MVP of 1986 Labyrinth? David Bowie, I just, he makes this movie. He elevates it and he is just the perfect Jareth. Like they're just, to me, there is nobody else that could have done that. And without Jareth, you really don't have a movie. So it's, it's gotta be David Bowie. It's almost like the character could be written and it would be different. And if you get David Bowie, then he's going to bring Jareth to you. Yes. Yes. Very well said. Brian, who's your MVP? Oh, Bowie. 
It's got to be. As interesting as the plot and the ergonomics, I think is a, is a good word for this movie, um, are for the time, it, it has to be Bowie. If I was forced to choose an actor, it would have to be Bowie. Based on the things I've already said, I'm going with Jim Henson here. Uh, last mm-hmm. movie he directed, he was a visionary, and he was a boon upon the world. And I will miss him. So, who is your best supporting actor, Lizzie? I put Jennifer Connelly. I think she does a great job. She is, I think she does fantastic at having that childlike innocence while also really at the end of the movie towards while she's still in the labyrinth, you really do start to slowly but surely see these nuggets of transition of somebody who is self-assured and confident and capable. And she just does a really, really good job of having that vulnerability that's really necessary in order to achieve that transition. Yeah, that's a really well put, Ashley. Brian, best supporting. I went with the Daves. The golds and... It took three Daves to make Didymus happen. <laughs> and I'm giving all three Daves credit. This is actually a heavy Dave movie. Like, nice. if you had David Bowie... Like, there's a lot of Daves going through this place. But yeah, the three Daves that made Didymus happen. Didymus is a fun character. But we, we didn't actually dive too deep into all the companions. Um, I, I will say one of the reasons He's I didn't... by far my favorite. Is because my, my, my best supporting actor, I said it was hard to say, I'm going with my best supporting goblin, uh, which is Hoggle. Uh, I, I think he had a depth that a lot of children might not get. I think his conflict was welcome. <laughs> I, I, his animatronic was extremely advanced. I think it's the most advanced one. His sense of humor is pretty good. His cowardice is good. Uh, I would say in most things like in, in Winnie the Pooh or in, in other like media, the coward character is one I've never been drawn to. I don't even need Hoggle's bravery for jumping at, on the top of the goblin mech at the end. I, d- I didn't need that to, to like redeem him. He didn't really give up on himself. Uh, really, uh, what happens so frequently is that I end up praising the character's writing more than the performance. And in this case, there's only two actors. So I had to fudge this a little bit. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Hoggle was my best supporting. No, I, I got a question real quick. Would there be a James P. Sullivan if there wasn't Ludo? No. No way. Uh, L- L- Ludo created i have to think that and this is going to be crazy 38 years ago ludo was a new archetype for us to play with in all media big big friendly monster snuffleupagus was an imaginary monster imaginary he was big bird's imaginary friend before he was anything yeah um yeah that's the same (laughs) lizzie lizzie what's your what's your hidden gem Um, My hidden gem is during the magic dance sequence. David Bowie throws up the baby and at one point he throws the baby up and it's just, it's the the actual baby who I believe his name is actually Toby. Toby. But then there's a scene later where he throws, but it's just so clearly a stuffed baby. (laughs) And it just gets me every time I laugh every single, it's like, Puts me in stitches every single time. And I can't decide if that was intentional or not, but I just, either way, I love it. It might be due to watching it on the quality of TVs that we have nowadays. It's possible. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Something they wouldn't have caught 30 years but ago. That's a great gag. Speaking I, I of know. catching. I, I, Go ahead, Brian. I, I will say one thing on this. Every time someone hands someone a cup that is very clearly empty in movies and TV, based on how the actor handles that cup once it's handed to them. Right. Is, is nails on a chalkboard for Gets me. Gets on your nerves. Yeah. So it, it so I, I hear you on, it's like, yeah, clearly stuffed child, but <laughs> man, there, there are a lot of really well-produced, very good, it, even good actors do it, but man, I can't unsee it. Mm. That's a touchstone <laughs> for, yeah, when you're watching a movie. But what's your hidden gem here, Brian? Uh, mine is actually the dad. 
the dad is Zev mm. or Rogue Two. We found them <laughs> from Empire Strikes Back. That like I was just like, no really? way. We wow. found them. That's yes, awesome. we found them. I was like, this is messing with me so hard right now. I was like, look, we got Rogue Two is the dad. <laughs> That's that is maybe the hiddenest gem I've heard on this show. Oh, dude, I, I seriously was staring at him like, <laughs> put some orange lenses on his face, and that's Rogue Two right there. Wow. my I thought I had a hiddenest gem. Uh, I, I came in <laughs> armed with three. I was joking with Lizzie that uh, I, I could be my own like trivia encyclopedia on this on this movie. There is a fraggle in Sarah's room. It's red. Uh, it's a stuffed fraggle. And when at the end of the party... Uh, scene at the end, uh, the man with the hat, the bird hat, uh, picks up the fraggle and swings him around. Uh, you mentioned my other, uh, one of my other options, Lizzie, which was that David Bowie's hands are not doing the contact juggling. Uh, yes. that, that is, that's a man named Michael Moskin who's doing it, and, and he just stands behind him and does it for him. It's, I imagine it was a little awkward to film, but it looks flawless. Yes. And then there was, after all the viewings I've had, there was a brand new one that came across this time. Something I noticed. When we were introduced to Hoggle, he's peeing in a fountain. As, as with, yes. that, with that as the start of my sentence, do you guys know what, my, what I'm getting at? Like a Calvin and Hobbes piece? It's not a Calvin and Hobbes thing. That would make sense. Uh, it's when they enter the Goblin City, there is a fountain where the piece in the middle of the fountain instead of like an angel or a swan is like 10 hoggles in a square peeing outward into the, into the pond. Huh? It's very hard. I to, it, that. It, very amazing. easy to miss, <laughs> but I, I happened to catch it this time. Yeah. That's hilarious. Which means there's a lot of stone. He's a very well-known pond peer. <laughs> Don't let your children yeah. play in this. That's right. Yeah. So they, they had to use the Jim Henson creature shop to create a whole bunch of hoggle dongles. Okay. Lizzie, it's time to recast someone. This is hard for this movie. Uh, yes. How do we do this? Honestly, this is really hard because I'm not replacing Jennifer Connelly or Bowie. Um, so I, I really enjoy Hoggle on paper, but I think his actual voice is irritating. So mm. I decided that I would replace him with Gonzo because he feels <laughs> like... Honestly, he's the coward in all of the Jim Henson movies, or he's usually like the questionable character good guy where he's kind of toying the line between being good and bad. So I feel like he'd be kind of an appropriate find to replace him. So in my world, if we could just grab Gonzo off the shelf and just put him in here, that's what I would do. Gonzo, voiced by the same Dave as Didymus, Dave Goltz, uh, does okay. Gonzo. Well, it'd be perfect. It'd be per he'd, he's there for it. And then Still too firm. the other thing about Gonzo's voice is uh, he does have kind of, he's got kind of a raspy, a little bit grating voice, but it's, a, it's kind of silly fun. Uh, yes. In the Muppet movie, his his song, his, his featured song, uh, I'm going to go back there someday, is a tearjerker for me. It's a beautiful song mm -hmm. in that one. Uh, what is your recast, Brian? I, I'm recasting the stepmom okay. to Caroline Blackiston. She plays Mon Mothma. Okay, I knew it. In Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew so you were sense. picking a Star Wars character for this, and it I, is very I just, funny. I wanted, I wanted the, I wanted the snow speeder pilot to be married to the leader of the re, uh, resistance. Um, we're we're going with uh, Carolyn oh Blackinson. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice, Brian. <laughs> One everyone will love. <laughs> <laughs> It literally fell out of the sky, and I was like, ooh, I can make this yeah. connect. That's <laughs> good, <laughs> man. Uh, my recast, this is blasphemy. But if I, if I had to, I don't want to. I would replace Jennifer Connelly with Jennifer Grey. Ooh, I could see that. I could see that. She has that same ability to be vulnerable and could pull that off. Yeah. Uh, I, it, the movie would be worse. I like but her face less. We have to do it. That's the part of the show. We yeah, have, we have to do it. Uh, Lizzie, what is your best Just shot? Just like a parent, like I always do. 
Um, my favorite shot is in the very, very beginning of when she enters into the labyrinth and she's looking at the wall and thinking the wall just goes on forever. And the little worm tells her not to take anything for granted. I think that the shot is so cool because you're looking at the wall and you as the viewer are truly thinking that it's just this big, long wall. But then all of a sudden they focus in on that optical illusion that there is a break in the wall. And I, every single time, I know it's about to happen, but I too still see that shift when it happens. And I feel like that had to have been some kind of interesting camera angle, being able to make sure that, you know, just like an inch over to the left, it looks like it's one wall, but then we're just going to shift it right here and then make sure that we see that break. I, I'm so impressed every single time that I watch that they're able to achieve that. It's better that they don't do some kind of shimmer effect. That they, Agreed. Yeah. yeah, like it's one full shot. It's yeah. it's really good. It is really good. Brian, what's your best shot? Mine is her initially going down into the helping hands because it, it Never hit me until this rewatch how much that reminded me of the poster for Drag Me to Hell. <laughs> and and, and yeah. I'm just wondering how many different scenes, how many different shots from this movie influence movies to come. There, there's a lot. There's a lot to pull Man. from. And, and and there's there's no excuse for anybody that gets involved with like media or uh art design for them not to it's like you would have a, a section of your class of a month or five weeks or something devoted to well let's look at how jim henson or let's look how the muppets did it or let's look at, at like dark crystal or let's let's look at dick tracy like things that were like a little different right like th this this had to be influential in that sense that that makes sense to me uh my best shot i did mention it earlier it is immediately after eating the peach she uh she like looks through a branch and she starts talking about like the dancing that she's witnessing and the bubbles come and there's something special about the landscape that you get outside the goblin city but also you have didymus and ludo who remember these are advanced sort of animatronic faces uh do kind of a look of wonder or surprise at the bubble she's trapped in and it's it's just an attention to detail that was really, it, it caught me this time. So that was my best shot. That's good. Lizzie, what's your best scene? The whole magic dance sequence is just so good. Like the song is fantastic. David Bowie's performance, that's really where he gets to shine, is doing his little, yeah, I saw my baby. It's just so good. And then all of the work with every tiny little goblin and making sure that there's so much going on in every single sequence. And then to top it all off with a big cherry, they've got like an actual baby that they also have to deal with. And it's just, it's like, it's, it's just such an, um, there's so much going on and it is so, so good. And to me, that scene is really what makes the entire movie for me. Like I could watch that specific scene and feel satiated. I actually really like how, uh, the, the baby is is only happy in this movie when Jareth and the goblins are around. Right? Yeah. I think that's so great. It's like, yeah, hey, you know, I took him away, but he wants this. The, he the, likes us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he likes us. <laughs> uh, what's your best scene, Brian? Fast forward several years and that baby is like, yeah, I want to do this thing called New Metal. It's going to be really, really big. It's going to be cool. <laughs> um my favorite uh my favorite scene was chasing the baby in the crazy stairs yeah because that's exactly what having children is like <laughs> <laughs> i was watching that and i was like yeah yeah that yeah it just sounds like, like my nothing prepared jennifer Connolly's character for having children <laughs> like chasing that baby through crazy stairs that's that's accurate <laughs> That is so true. My my daughter, my youngest, she's two. She'll now she'll have she does the courtesy of telling me that she's about to do something chaotic. She's like, I'm gonna throw I gotta throw it. And then she'll <laughs> look at me, I'm like, Don't throw it. I gotta throw it. At the window. 
<laughs> really hard, mommy. Really hard. Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> Even some... if she'll get mad at me and she'll go, I got to hit you. <laughs> Lizzie, is this the result of some monkey's paw curse? Where y- you are you are getting forethought and warning as to what's about to happen, but you are still powerless to stop it. <laughs> right. I gotta hit you, and I'm like, "Don't hit me!" Then she'll literally. <laughs> well, uh, then, uh, the, the fault the faults really ours because we try to reason with them, and there is no reasoning with a toddler. Like not you with think, a two year old. No, we're, we're, we're gonna. Yeah, m- mine's three, but there's still no reasoning, and uh, I'm just no, like. Yeah. Like, let's talk this out. Like, I'm all about let's let's have a conversation about this. And meanwhile, the smile gets bigger. Oh yes, yeah, yeah that is right. It is very accurate. It really is like yeah, chasing. Just just rolling, yeah, just, it, I'll do it anyway. We're in the middle of a packed elevator that opens. I'm running now. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> yes, you can't. I gotta run. Yeah, I gotta run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my best scene is uh, it's the interaction between Sarah Hoggle and Jareth right before the cleaners come down the hallway. The uh, s- like the circular bladed monstrosity mm-hmm. that is coming through to that's very scary. Uh, yes. That thing, and they must get away. But their interaction that happens before it is uh is and it's another one of those like playful moments between like okay how how are are you dealing how 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 do you like my labyrinth she has to put on a brave face it's a piece of cake well how about this little slice as it's it's all so heavy like the 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 dialogue is is meaningful you know hoggle is scared and he has just revealed himself from like a kind of a, a muppet costume like, oh he's he's here you see just how powerful he is i, I thought that was a, kind of a tone setting scene there's so many fun scenes yes. that one was a tone setting scene okay uh this is maybe one of the harder harder ones here uh best wardrobe or makeup moment lizzie i think Sarah's hair during her dream sequence. You touched on it a little bit, but that really stands out to me. Like there's so much hair. They, you had to have used so many extensions and the way that it's curled and like the pretty like jewelry pieces that are in it. Like even looking at it now as an adult, like I actually love that hair. Like it is crazy, but somehow timeless. And I, I just, I love that that hairdo and all of the accessories and the volume. It's just amazing. Yeah. I thought to myself, it's like almost teased out behind. It's like, it's high. It's far back. Like, uh, yes. Like Frankenstein's wife or whatever they call it. Uh, but it, I, it is, it's really pretty too. Brian, what's your uh, best makeup or wardrobe moment? As a bald man, I am just seriously in envy of David Bowie's everything. Because that man can make a mullet look good. And that's like, we used to play a game uh, back when I first started going bald. Like, would you wear that hair or be bald? And we would talk about horrible hairstyles, like really terrible ones. And be like, would you have that or bald? And most of the time I would be like bald. But Bowie makes anything look presentable. And mm, I, j- I just wish I could roll that because then if I you could have hair. that hair today, you would take it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I have to be able to wear it like Bowie. Well, that and means you, you'd like, have to you'd have to adjust your wardrobe a bit. But once you have it, <laughs> you, like, dude, I can do you a master to go in that direction. With that hair, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That'd be good. I kind of can't believe it. I picked the exact <laughs> same thing, Lizzie. It's her hair. Yay! Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. It's her hair in that scene. Not the dress, not the makeup. It's not Bowie's eyeliner. It's not the cod piece. It's, it is that hair. It's so, so good. Uh, enough said. I love it. I imagine that that took so long and took so many extensions, and but it all is put together so perfectly. I, I love it. Well, and it helps that it's during the best song in the movie for me. 
I know you like yes. Magic Dance. I like As yes. the World Falls Down. Uh, change one thing, Lizzie. What are you changing? This is just for my son because I, I have a really hard time finding anything that I would change. I would just do the the chili um, chili down song just does not involve decapitation or a decapitation <laughs> attempt. That maybe because I think had that not been in there, I think Wilder would have wanted to finish it. So that's just solely for him because that was a little too much for him. Yeah, I know what we could do. We could take off her head. Yeah, yeah where you go with that head? <laughs> Girl, where you go with a head like that? Oh, I, <laughs> I think that's so great. Um, I can see why, though. Yeah, if that, that could be fun. I mean, there's fire, there's limbs coming off. But if it weren't trying to take off her head, then it wouldn't be as scary. I can see that. Yes. Uh, Brian, what are you changing? Uh, I saw so many connecting pieces to Alice in Wonderland in this that I wish I had seen a, a Jim Henson presents Alice in Wonderland. That's the change is that, oh, th- this should have been tackled by. Just that, that because this was so successful and such a beloved movie, I would have changed the fact that he never tackled Alice in Wonderland. And I've seen. Even the TV iterations, I've seen almost, I think almost every Alice in Wonderland. There were a couple TV uh, versions back in the 60s and 70s that I missed. But um, yeah, by and large, I'm a, uh, I'm not a fan of the Johnny Depp one, but Neither by am and I. large, I've seen all of them. And uh, you a fan I, of I'm that. literally biding my time until my daughter's old enough to like really settle down and listen to a story because that's the first thing I'm going to read her. Mm. I am changing. I think her relationship with her parents doesn't have to be bad. Uh, I'd somehow clean up the reasoning behind her home life dissatisfaction. Uh, She, there were some things brought up in this show that I thought were really interesting. Um, But I just, I don't know if it was needed. Uh, she's she's allowed to go off and you know play around in the park. It's not like she had some other duty she was missing. Uh, I I don't know. It, it's some that's the only part of this movie that like doesn't matter to me. Like I'm kind of my my brain is like, can we rush to the fun part? Um, right. But but even even the very first chance you the first introduction you get to goblins is a screen full of 30 goblin faces where they're all hiding waiting for her to say the words and it's like five minutes in it's like whoa this is what it is and they're there and it's, it's, i don't know it's it's hard for me to find something to criticize but I, I, that's just something that's not that important to me as a teenager and your parents are about to leave for the night you're telling me you don't have a team of goblins waiting behind the door going, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> 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 Did she say like, it? Like, that's how that watched me. Yeah, like, I understand it was focused on the child you don't want to be babysitting right now. But yeah. what you do after that child goes to sleep, because I was, I was, I'm 10 years older than my brother. So I, I did a fair amount of babysitting as the older brother. And when the older, younger brother goes to sleep, I totally understand the closet of goblins being like, <laughs> go on, go on, yeah. go so die. <laughs> That's good. I was the baby, so I cannot relate to that. But I do think that they probably wanted to set the tone of, because I, I do agree, her parents are not, like, they're not bad people it's more of just a representation of she's just feeling like growing pains in general. So even though her parents are like nice parents, like they're being like you, you, I think it's like they want her to babysit Toby and then like, but we're going to be back in time for you to do something that you want to do. And they're trying to kind of work with her a little bit. And, um, you know, she just watching it as a parent, you watch it like with a different lens, but I think that they're trying to drum dramatize like her, her own personal growing pain. So honestly, it doesn't really even matter if her parents are actually cruel or not because they just are to her because they're not letting her do whatever she wants. Like she's still in that yeah. childlike stage where if you don't give me my way, then you're mean. Well, and I, I think, you know, there's, there's two instances I can think of. There's a Sunday, a Sunday sized comic strip of Calvin having a bad day in Calvin and Hobbes and each 
picture in the big Sunday comic strip is like, boy, you really feel for his bad day. And then you take uh, the most drastic example, which is the first two minutes of Up. You can tell a lot of a story in a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And so I don't I don't know. It's not like I'm it's not like I feel like it's bad. It's just uh, I don't think I need it. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to redo the movie. Let's do best quote. Our last superlative. Lizzie. It's only forever. Not long at all. I just think that is so haunting and fantastic. And it's also just a very beautiful line. And I just I, I, everything about it. I love. Yeah, that's that's and, really good. Yeah. In and terms of a, in terms of a human existence, very poignant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was hard for me not to pick a lyric. Did you pick a lyric, Brian? No, I didn't. Um, I went with uh, I asked for so little. Just fear me, love me, do as I say, and I will, and be, I your will be your slave. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Though it's it's a it's a a parlay. It's a begging at the end. It, it's it's in, it's very interesting. That's a good choice. Uh, I went with kind of a, a funnier one, uh, which is a uh, Saludo. Canst thou summon up the very rocks? Sure, rocks, friends. Oh yeah, <laughs> and they just come right up. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, the, rocks friends. Rocks friends. Uh, that's that's good stuff. Well, it's time for us to give our rating. Decide how we recommend this movie if we do it all. Uh, we do a five star scale. Point five is the lowest. Five is the highest. Half star intervals. If you'd like, Lizzie, how do you rate Labyrinth? Honestly, this movie is a five star for me. I love it so much. This from. For me, this is a movie that I can put on on a rainy day. Like you had said, like Netflix and chill. Like this is the type of movie that I will do that. If I am bored and I just want a comfort movie, this is what I will go to. But I feel like I always get something new out of it whenever I watch it. And I love being able to dissect it in this way where we're really talking about like what these characters represent in Sarah's world. I... It, the movie is sophisticated while still being goofy and fun. Mm. And it just has all the things that I love in it so dearly. So it's it's got to be five stars for me. That's a good rating. Brian, follow that up. I read a book last week that was kind of disturbing, but also I understood some of the pieces the main character was going through and building a kind of fortress of solitude in a way. And the things that she used to build that fortress. And I started thinking about movies that really meant something to me. And because Lord of the Rings was such a big part of my childhood, um, I started thinking about how each tier of like Minas Tirith would be a different category of movie and movies that I love to build the walls that I, you know, encapsulate myself in in order to you know protect myself and I, i'm giving this a four star this is going to be fourth ring and uh yeah i i just uh I, I started thinking about things in a little bit different way based on the extra things that we have in our lives that we use to shield ourselves from harm and this is one of those movies that you would use to shield yourself from harm hmm really well put the pre- like the that. preamble to your to your star rate uh, ranking i'm going what are we getting at here <clears throat> and that is gosh <laughs> it's a it's a rainy day and you got stuck in traffic or you know report card came back and gosh it has not improved in math but like the music and the visuals in this movie can lift your spirits in that way or protect you from the stuff you might be interacting with Absolutely. Well, very cool way of putting it. I'm going to put it this way. Five stars. There was never a question from me. It is not a perfect movie like Scream. Uh, it is a favorite movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it is. I don't always give my favorites five stars. This movie. I, I mentioned it earlier. Like you can identify people who you will like and dislike. Based on if they like this movie. And. Furthermore, um, with with like we mentioned this with Boondock Saints, 
is that if you mention this movie, there's a good chance your response won't be, oh, I like that movie. It's going to be, oh, I love that movie from so <laughs> many people in varying degrees, but it's so memorable for so many of the right reasons. And even with me looking for things to dissect and potentially give this some detractors, uh, the things I found were of such small weight that I was like, this is still just so much fun. And there's a reason I just listen to the music whenever I feel like it. It's, I think, in my top 10 of albums I listen to. So well done, Trevor Jones. I'm surprised, you know, how did, I, how did I not give him the MVP? Because he's the one that put a lot of that music together. Uh, but yeah, great scores all around. It is time for us to choose a movie for next time. I got to serve up three movies for next time. And Lizzie, I need you to give me the answer here. So option number one, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers from 1956. Extraterrestrials traveling in high-tech flying saucers contact a scientist as part of a plan to enslave the inhabitants of Earth. Option number two, The Day the Earth Stood Still from 1951. An alien lands in Washington, D.C. and tells the people of Earth that they must live peacefully or be destroyed as a danger to other planets. Or option number three, The Thing from Another World, 1951. Scientists and American Air Force officials fend off a bloodthirsty alien organism while at a remote Arctic outpost. What's it going to be? I've never heard of the first one, and I'm always down to watch a newbie. So let's go Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Ooh, UFO. Yeah, we, we're going real deep back into the 50s for these. And uh, yeah, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Sounds good. Well, uh, I, we love our Dealer's Choice episodes. We love getting to cover somebody's favorite. Lizzie, thank you for serving this up to us. Yay, you're so welcome. This was fun. Brian, thanks for joining. And really, what an eloquent star ring. I, I loved it. I uh, always appreciate a good audience and a wonderful time with you guys. And thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, and review to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's mostly audio. Give us a like on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. Producing and providing this podcast is fun but not free. We invite you to support the show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash retromovieroundtable. Any contribution is much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Brian? Where it is, you're on your way down. Fresh meat. Finger licking good. <laughs>